Open your Bibles up to Romans chapter 12. Romans 12, if you're using one of those pew Bibles, page 1136 will land you in Romans chapter 12. We're back again to this great, great text in which Paul lays out a number of ingredients of true biblical love. This is the application section of his letter to the church at Rome. Begins here in chapter 12. After 11 chapters of relentless doctrine, Paul now begins to apply the amazing truths of the gospel that he has outlined for us and that we ourselves have studied over more than three years. So we are now applying the amazing truth that we've learned. And we've been doing it under the, the motif of a recipe that there are various key ingredients that go into a recipe in, in order that the end product comes out and it is something that is both appealing to the eye and to the palate. And we're calling it Paul's recipe for love. And we have looked at a number of the ingredients here over the last few weeks. We've noted that biblical love is a sincere kind of love, verse 9, where Paul says, let love be without hypocrisy. We've also noticed that biblical love is discerning, biblical love is affectionate, biblical love is respectful, and last week in verse 11 we noted that biblical love is passionate. We arrive here at verse 12 together this morning with the sixth ingredient, and the sixth ingredient is patient or patience. Biblical love is is a patient kind of love. You know, patience is universally admired and a generally absent virtue. People will readily acknowledge that patience is a wonderful thing, and yet, for most of us, it is something that is sorely lacking in our lives. We will willingly affirm its importance, but we will regularly reject its instruction. We will affirm its importance and reject its instruction. I was thinking about certain patience-building opportunities that come to all of us who live here in America, in Southern California, in the 21st century, and so I just scrawled down on a piece of paper a few of those patience learning opportunities which we so frequently reject. I was thinking about standing in line at the DMV. <laughs> standing in line at the Department of Motor Vehicles and I thought, you know what? That is a tremendous patience building opportunity and yet we, we don't see it that way. We reject it. It irritates us. It's something we would avoid like the plague, right? Or how about standing in the security line at the airport? Another patience-building opportunity as the line winds itself all the way around LAX before you can get in and get through the metal detectors to get on your flight. That is a patience-building opportunity. Or how about this one? Rush hour traffic. Rush hour traffic. We would do anything to avoid rush hour traffic. And yet, in the providence of God, what a tremendous patience building opportunity it really is. Or how about this one? How about the person in the cash only line at the department store who insists on writing a check? <laughs> what a patience building opportunity that is. Instead, we would grumble under our breath, they can't read. <laughs> But it's a patience-building opportunity. Or maybe one of my favorite patience-building opportunities, calling technical support. <laughs> I just love to call technical support and to be put on hold and to be transferred from one person to another who does not speak English <laughs> and cannot help me with my problem. What a tremendous patience-building opportunity that really is. You know, life is full of them. Life is full of opportunities to build patience if we will but approach it in the right way. Well, in the text before us this morning, we have three biblical patience-building ideas here in verse 12 of Romans chapter 12. 
Let me just read verse 12 for you. Paul says, Rejoicing in hope, persevering in tribulation, and devoted to prayer. Persevering, or excuse me, rejoicing in hope, persevering in tribulation, and devoted to prayer. These three short phrases all have a common idea. And the common idea is patience. That's what they have in common, patience, in all three of these. Paul links together for us in this verse hope, perseverance, and prayer because they naturally go together. They naturally go together. In fact, one could very safely say with regard to patience that hope is the basis of our patience, perseverance is the practice of our patience, and prayer is the power behind our patience. Hope is the basis, perseverance is the practice, and prayer is the power behind patience. Look again here at this verse, rejoicing, persevering, and the last is translated devoted, but these three are actually participles. They are present participles, and what they're communicating to us is that there is an ongoing active reality to these commands to patience. This is not a one-time event. This is not something that occurs once and you check it off and you're done, you're patient. These are things that we are to be constantly about because they will be constantly working patience in our hearts. Hoping, persevering, praying are patience activities. Patience activities. Let's look at them in individual Let's begin here with the first one, verse 12, rejoicing in hope. Do you see it? Rejoicing in hope. Hope. In the New Testament, hope is a confident trust. A confident trust rather than an uncertain expectation. When we hope, we hope with a very confident trust in the, in the future will come to pass. We're not uncertain about this at all. It is, a, it is a very certain reality for us because it is fixed on a very certain event, according to the New Testament, and that certain event is our redemption. Our hope is in our redemption, and our redemption is grounded in the historical reality of the death, burial, and resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. That historical reality provides the historical ground for new Testament hope. In fact, the Apostle Paul, very much aware of this, says over in 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and verse 17, speaking in the opposite way here, but he says, If Christ has not been raised, your faith is worthless, you are still in your sins. And then he continues, But Christ has been raised from the dead, and therefore our hope is absolutely certain. Absolutely certain. Just as Jesus conquered sin and death, so will we by virtue of our union with Jesus Christ. He conquered sin and death, and we conquer it as well. Let me just remind you, turn back a few pages to Romans chapter 8, at the end of chapter 8, verses 37 through 39, where the Apostle Paul reads, But in all these things we overwhelmingly conquer through Him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing shall be able to separate us from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. That is New Testament hope, beloved. That is New Testament hope. And the Apostle Paul says that we are to be continually, actively rejoicing in that kind of hope. Our sins are forgiven. We are to live eternally with Christ. We are in spiritual union with Him. It is by grace received through faith that has been produced in us what the Apostle Paul calls in In Colossians chapter 1 and verse 27, Christ in you, the hope of glory. 
the hope of glory. In fact, turning back again to Romans chapter 5, verses 1 and 2, Paul says, Therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom also we have obtained our introduction by faith into this grace in which we stand and we exalt in hope of the glory of God. Rejoicing in hope. Rejoicing in hope. A hope that is absolutely secure because it is grounded in the redemptive work of Jesus Christ on our behalf. Hope is certain, but it requires patience. It requires waiting to receive. We are not yet what we shall become. We have not yet seen Christ face to face. We have not yet been glorified. It is a certain reality, but there is a sense in which we must wait for it to unfold. There is a patient hope that we must have. And that reminds me of a story from many years ago. Many, many years ago, Carol's dad wanted a pair of binoculars for Christmas. He wanted a pair of binoculars for Christmas. And so her mom went out and bought him a pair of binoculars. And she She put them in a box, and she wrapped them up, and she put them on the head of the bed several weeks before Christmas so that he could gaze upon them. But she didn't tell him what was in the box. So he took the box down, and he shook it. He weighed it. He measured the dimensions of the box. And then he went to the Sears catalog. This is before the Internet. And he flipped through the Sears catalog to the section on binoculars, and he found a pair of binoculars in which the weight and box dimensions match that which was the gift on the head of the bed. At that point, his hope was certain he was getting binoculars for Christmas. And so he, he gleefully crowed around the house, I'm getting binoculars for Christmas. Well, her mother was not going to let that stand. And so while he was at work, she unwrapped the gift very carefully, removed the binoculars, and replaced them with two cans of corn and a necktie. (laughs) Closed up the box and rewrapped the gift and placed it back on the head of the bed. Now you know where it comes from, don't you? (laughs) Yes, indeed, Christmas morning. I can't wait to open my binoculars. My hope is certain that I have two cans of corn and a necktie. Wow. Later that day, she did give him his binoculars. She did. But that's kind of like hope is for us. It's it's an absolute certainty, beloved. We are to be made exactly like Jesus Christ. He has conquered death on our behalf. Our sins have been forgiven. We are united with Him spiritually. We possess eternal life here and now, and yet there is a sense in which we must patiently wait for it to be fulfilled within us. Our hope must be a patient hope. Secondly, verse 12, a second aspect here of the patience that is called upon us is a perseverance. Paul says here, persevering in tribulation. Perseverance is another aspect of patience. The word tribulation is a very interesting word in the New Testament. It can also be translated and frequently is translated affliction. Tribulation or affliction, they're almost equally used to translate the underlying Greek word. Literally, what it means for us is a pressing or a pressure. Tribulation or affliction is a pressing down or a pressure that comes upon us. It's used a number of ways in the New Testament. For example, and you can just scratch these down, check them on your own later if you'd like. Matthew chapter 24, verses 21 and 29, it's it's spoken of there as the future seven-year reign of the Antichrist. During the great tribulation, the great pressing down, the great pressure period, translated there, tribulation, 
It speaks of the seven-year reign of the Antichrist. Over in Acts chapter 7, verse 11, the same Greek word is there used to speak of the results of a famine. The results of a famine are an affliction, are a pressure that comes to bear on people. 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 13, Philippians chapter 4, verse 14, James chapter 1, verse 27, 2 Corinthians 8, 13, Philippians 4, 14, James 1, 27, if you're keeping score. It is there spoken of poverty and want. The condition of poverty and want is that same underlying Greek word that speaks of a pressing down or a pressure that comes upon people. Interestingly, in John chapter 16, verse 21, it's used there to speak of the anguish of childbirth. The anguish of childbirth is the same underlying Greek word, pressure, pressing down. Acts 11, verse 19, it's spoken of as persecution. Persecution becomes an affliction, becomes a tribulation, becomes a pressure upon the believers. 1 Corinthians 7 and verse 28, it is used to speak of trouble in this life. I think it has a, perhaps a more general reference there. The trouble that comes to us in this life, pressing down on us, pressuring us. Here in Romans chapter 12 and verse 12, where he, speaking to the church, says that we are to be persevering, or they are to be persevering in tribulation, I believe he's speaking of an external pressure there that is coming upon the church at Rome because of the hostility of the unbelieving pagans there in Rome. I think he's talking about the pressure that comes to them as they try to live for Jesus Christ as lights in a very, very dark world. He says in chapter 1 and verse 16, Paul starts his epistle, and he says, I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. I have no shame for this gospel in a world in which it is seen to be a very shameful thing. He says over in chapter 16 and verse 20, he writing to the church at Rome, he says, Satan will soon be crushed under your feet. The idea behind that, I believe, is that there is a satanically inspired pressure or affliction or tribulation that's coming upon these early believers. In the face of this kind of pressure, look again at Romans 12, 12. Paul speaks to the believers and he says that they are to persevere. They are to be persevering. It's to be an ongoing reality of their life. Persevere. The idea is to endure. They are to endure. They are to stand up. They are to bear up under the pressure. They are to endure the pressure. Why? Why can Paul say to them, you are to continue to stand up under this kind of pressure? The answer is, is because their hope is secure in Jesus Christ. Their hope is secure in Jesus Christ. And because their hope is secure in Christ, their response to the pressure that comes upon them is to hold up under it, is to stand up, is to bear up, it's to endure. 2 Corinthians chapter 4 Verses 16 and following. The Apostle Paul, speaking of himself, he says, Therefore we do not lose heart. Therefore we do not lose heart. But though our outer man is decaying, yet our inner man is being renewed day by day. For momentary light affliction is producing for us an eternal weight of glory far beyond all comparison. While we look not at things which are seen, but at things which are not seen. For the things which are seen are temporal, but the things which are not seen are eternal. Wow. Paul, whose life is characterized by one who has suffered affliction, one upon whom there has been tremendous pressure and pressing down upon him as he sought to plant churches throughout the, the known world of that time, he says that the pressure that's come upon me is a momentary light affliction. I can bear up under it. I can persevere. I can stand up to it because, you know what, it's not going to last forever. 
It is not going to last forever. And not only that, compared to the reality of glory before me that is secure in Jesus Christ, my hope in Christ, it doesn't add up. It's an easy equation to do. Wow, what a perspective. What a perspective the Apostle Paul says. Beloved, we are to have that same perspective. We are to be enduring. We are to be standing up, standing firm, persevering patiently in tribulation. Life is an obstacle course. Will you grant me that? Life is an obstacle course. Therefore, we should not be surprised when things don't go as we have planned them. I mean, whose life has worked out exactly the way you expected it to? I can remember my own life. When I was young, I I had it all planned out. All these things that I was going to do and accomplish, and, and on and on it went, and very little of it, very little of it has actually come to fruition. Life is an obstacle course. It comes at you with one trial or tribulation or affliction after another. And the longer you live, the more you realize that that is the reality of it. It's not just a temporary thing, young people, that you're going through. This is life. We have an expression in our home that this is a season of life we're going through. Well, in a sense, it is a season of life, followed by another season, followed by another season, followed by another season. And they all have something in common. They're filled with affliction. They're filled with affliction. The loss of health. The loss of employment. The loss of financial security. Even death. These are common to what it means to be human. To live in a fallen, broken world. It comes to everyone. It comes to everyone. They are shared, these afflictions are shared by believer and unbeliever alike. But for those of us who are followers of Jesus Christ, those of us who have by faith bowed the knee before Christ, we have humbled our heart before Him and He has saved us, additional affliction comes as well. Additional affliction. It is the the pressure, the affliction that's caused by our unrelenting commitment to the Lordship of Jesus Christ which sets us on a collision course with this world. Collision course. And it brings affliction. If you're under the load right now, I want you to remember something. If you're feeling under the load right now and you're a follower of Jesus Christ, I want you to remember something. Bad as it is, bad as it is, this is as close as you will ever come to the horrors of hell. This is as bad as it gets for you who know Jesus Christ. And for you who do not know Jesus Christ this morning, this is as good as it's going to get. This is as close to heaven as you will ever come. It is appointed unto man to die once, and then comes the judgment. The judgment. If you do not know Christ this morning, and life is pressuring you, life is squeezing in on you, God is giving you opportunity right now to change the direction of your life. He offers to you life everlasting through His Son, Jesus Christ, if you will, but by faith embrace the gift. If you will, 
then you can join those who know Christ with the hope, a certain hope of everlasting life and a realization that, yes, life is bad and bad things come, but this is as bad as it gets. And in fact, the Apostle Paul calls it a momentary light affliction. Rejoicing in hope, Paul says. Persevering in tribulation. Third, third, devoted to prayer. Devoted to prayer. Beloved, the power to hold up, the power to hold up to the pressures of life comes only by maintaining our focus on the hope of glory. Only by maintaining our focus on the hope of glory will we receive the supernatural power that that comes only from God as we commune with Him in prayer. It is prayer that enables us to tap into the God of the universe, receive the power necessary to hold up in life. Paul knows this to be true, and look again at this verse. He speaks to this church, this church is being afflicted, this church is under tribulation, and he, he speaks to them there, and, and he commands them to the patient practice of prayer. Be devoted, be continually devoting yourself to prayer would be a more literal way of translating this. Devoted, attend to it constantly, continue all the time in it. An active and regular prayer life is both commanded of the believer in the New Testament and it is modeled for us in the New Testament. Colossians chapter 4, verse 2. Paul says, devote yourself to prayer. There it is again. Keeping alert in it with an attitude of thanksgiving. Devote yourself to prayer, he says. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 17, pray without ceasing. Pray without ceasing. Acts chapter 1, verse 14, right after Christ had ascended, he said, it, Luke records there that these all with one mind, that is the, the small band of disciples, these all with one mind were continually devoting themselves to prayer along with the women and Mary, the mother of Jesus, and with his brothers, continually devoting themselves to prayer. Acts chapter 2, verse 42. That day of Pentecost and going forward, when 3,000 souls were saved and the church was birthed in a mighty work of the power of the Spirit of God, it says they were continually devoting themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, to the breaking of the bread, and to literally the prayers. The prayers. A continual devotion to prayer is an expectation of the Christian life. It is commanded upon us and it is modeled for us. And you know, I have very little doubt that virtually every single person in this room would affirm the truthfulness of that. If we were to go around the room and, and poll each and every one of us, I suspect that almost every single one of us would affirm the necessity of a regular and consistent time of prayer with the Lord. You think I'm okay on that? Can I hear an amen on that? <laughs> Yet I also have very little doubt that most of us do not maintain a regular and consistent prayer life. How can that be? How can it be something that we would all affirm is a necessity? One of our five core values says that we are dedicated to what? You don't even remember. <laughs> dedicated to prayer. We would affirm it. We affirm it as a group. We would affirm it individually, and yet Individually, we seldom, so seldom practice that which we affirm. So seldom. Why is that? Why is it something we would say is so important, something that is commanded upon us, something that is modeled for us, 
We agree with it, it's important, and yet we do such a poor job practicing it. Why is that? I think there are a couple of reasons. I think there are a couple of reasons why that's true. The first is because we're not really convinced we need the help. Deep down inside, we're really not all that convinced we need God's help. Jesus said, apart from me, you can do nothing, John 15 and verse 5. Yet day in and day out, many of us can accomplish all kinds of things. Isn't that true? With a very thin prayer life. An occasional prayer that we dash off to the Lord as we're going here or there. And we seem to accomplish all kinds of things. So how can it be, Jesus says, apart from me, you can do nothing? What a contrast to the early church. What a contrast to the early church. These all with one mind, Acts 1.14, were continually devoting themselves to prayer. Acts 2.42, they were continually devoting themselves to the prayers. That was the early church. I don't think that we can honestly say that of the modern church. I don't think we can say that. I think here's the secret. I've been thinking about this a lot this week. Herein lies the secret. The early church was seeking to turn the world right side up for Christ. Isn't that true? They were preaching the gospel everywhere. The Great Commission was a very serious thing for them. Going into the world and making disciples, baptizing in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you, and lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the age. And they were continually calling out on him for his assistance and aid. I think one of the reasons that we don't pray is because we don't think we need the help. And the reason we don't think we need the help is because we are so thinly engaged with our world to turn it upside down for Christ. We have managed to compartmentalize our lives in such a way that we can live outwardly in a pretty successful way without the need for dependence upon God. We're not driven to our knees for God. We prepare Sunday school lessons and teach them with little or no prayer. We go about our work week doing all kinds of things with little or no prayer. We're not engaged in the fight. I think if we were really engaged in the fight, we would have no alternative but to turn to God and to beg Him for the power to accomplish that which He has called of us. You know what? This church planting team that goes out to Fontana Summit Bible Church, they are going to be a praying team. And you know why they're going to be a praying team? Because there's going to be nothing that can cover it all up. There's no big program. There's no big crowds. There's no aura of success around them. They can't congratulate themselves, slap themselves on the back, say what a fine job we're doing. Because there's just a handful of them. And they're going to come face to face with their inadequacy and their dependence on the power of God. This will be a praying group of people. A praying group of people. One of the reasons I believe that we do not pray is because we are not convinced that we really need God's help. I believe there's a second reason. A second reason why we do not pray, as has been commanded upon us here, that is a continual devotion to prayer. And I believe the answer to that is is because prayer is hard work. Prayer is hard work. 
hard work. I believe it is the hardest work of the Christian life. It is the most difficult. It is harder to pray than it is to go door to door. Because you can go door to door in the flesh. You can go door to door in the flesh. People do it all the time. They knock on my door and they want to sell me this and they want to sell me that. It's hard work. You know, prayer changes us, not God. You know that, right? When we're praying, it's not God who changes, it's us who change. We are brought into conformity with His will. Therefore, prayer is an exercise in patience. It is an exercise in patience because God frequently makes us wait. He makes us wait for an answer. Isn't that true? It is God's timing. It is not my timing. It is God's timing. You know, speaking of waiting, it reminds me of a little story. Preacher's five-year-old daughter noticed that her father always paused and bowed his head for a moment before starting his sermon. One day she asked him, Why do you do that, Daddy? Well, honey, he began, proud that his daughter was so observant of his messages. I'm asking the Lord to help me preach a good sermon. How come he doesn't answer it, she asked. (laughs) children. They're good for patience. They're good for patience. Isn't that true? We ask, and he doesn't answer. We pray, and the heavens are like brass, and we give up. We give up. It's hard. It's hard. You know, Jesus recognized the reality that prayer requires persistence, And he taught on the the need for persistent prayer. He he told a parable in Luke chapter 18 about the need for persistence in prayer. You know it. It was near the end of his ministry. and, And he told this parable about this widow... And an unrighteous judge. And, and this widow needed this judge to intervene on her behalf. And, and he wouldn't do it. And so she continued to badger him. Day after day after day, she went back to him. And she asked him for justice. And finally, the unrighteous judge said, I will give this woman what she wants before she wears me out. Now what in the world does that have to do with prayer? The answer is very, very simple. God wants to answer your prayer. But He wants it to be asked in a persistent fashion. God is willing. In fact, Jesus ends that parable and He says, when the Son of Man returns, will He find faith in the earth? And what He is basically saying is that God will answer. The question is, will you continue to ask? Will you continue to ask? Persistence. Patience in prayer. Rejoicing in hope, Paul says. Persevering in tribulation or pressure. Constantly devoted to prayer. How does prayer, perseverance, and hope relate to love? The overall context here in Romans 12, beginning in verse 9, is love. We've established that. How do these relate to love? What does patience have to do with love in the body? The answer is in the statement, the body itself. We are are in relationship to each other. We are in a relationship called the body. It is a love relationship. And how we conduct ourselves in that relationship has a great impact on everyone else. Our patience impacts other people, and our impatience impacts other people. 
For example, for some of you, your patience in the face of trial encourages me. It's an encouragement to me. Those of you who are suffering physical affliction and you patiently endure and hold up under it, that is an encouragement to me. It is also a silent rebuke to me when I have some affliction and I find myself moaning and groaning and whining. Some of you have chronic pain. It never leaves you. Hour by hour, day by day, waking up multiple times throughout the night. You can't remember the last time you've had a full night's sleep. And yet when I see you and I ask how you're doing, you tell me, God is sustaining me. God is sustaining me. That's an encouragement to me. That is an expression of love to me. And it's a very, it's a silent exhortation. It's a silent exhortation to, to imitate your devotion to Christ. Huh. When you rejoice in our common hope, that inspires me. I want to ask you how you're doing, and, and you talk about the gospel. When it, whenever we have a conversation together and the gospel is always part of the conversation, that inspires me. Your mind is fixed on your hope, my hope, our hope. That's inspiring. Conversely, if the gospel is never on your lips, it's discouraging. It's discouraging. We are in a love relationship with each other. You love me as you inspire me with your gospel preaching. I hope that I inspire you. Beloved, our private times of prayer, our public times of prayer, they bind our hearts together. They draw us together here at Foothill in what God is doing. As He changes us, He brings every single one of us in line with His will for this body, and we go forth together in unity, and it is a function of our time of prayer. Corporate prayer meetings are important. They are not optional. It is the time for us to come together and to pray, to be like-minded, to have the Spirit of God change us. And private prayer is important. It is private prayer that, that quietly brings our will in alignment with His. Do we want unity in the body? Yes. Do we want unity in the body? Yes. Do we want unity in the body? Yes. yes. There's only one way to have unity. It is as God changes us to the likeness of Christ and His will that we will then come into a unified position, a unified body. That which is theologically true, positionally true, becomes experimentally, experientially a reality as we pray and God transforms us. If our prayer life is thin, there's not much transformation going on. We pray together, we're united together. And finally, some of you come up to me from time to time or occasionally you'll send me an email and it says, I'm praying for you. I'm praying for you. You know what? That expresses to me how much you love me. That is a tangible expression of your love for me. And you know why it is? Because I know how hard it is to pray. I know how hard it is to pray, to disciple your mind, to set aside the time, to put away the cares of the world, to get outside of yourself, to think about somebody else and their troubles and their concerns beyond your own little world. And so when you begin to pray for someone else, and when you tell me you're praying for me, what you are screaming at me is, I love you. We pray to eat for each other. That is a tangible expression of love. Of love. This is the very best gift you could ever give. The very best gift. Rejoicing in hope. Persevering in tribulation. Devoted to prayer. 
patience. 1 Corinthians chapter 13 says, Love is what? Patient. Love is patient. Oh, may the Lord grant us grace to grow in this significant area of the Christian life. This is an area of the life of our lives, beloved, where to a very great degree God alone can see. He's examining our hearts even now. Let's pray. Well, Father, search our hearts. And reveal, Lord, the hidden sin within. Humble our hearts, O Lord, that we might pray, that we might persevere, and that our attention, our hope, might be before our eyes. Christ in you, the hope of glory. Oh Lord, we confess that patience is something that we do not possess. It is not natural to us. It is not a product of the human will. It is the result of your Spirit working slowly, powerfully, inexorably, to bring about His purpose in our lives. But Lord, we can resist the Spirit's work. We can resist the Spirit's work by our own arrogance, by our own refusal to humble our heart, by our own rejection, the virtue of patience. But Father, please, let us not fall prey to this wicked sin. O oh Lord, work in the lives of your people. Unite us together. May we be a people who love one another. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. I would just like to say this one other thing, though. If, if you're here this morning and you do not know Jesus Christ, and I said to you that this this is as good as it's going to get for you, and indeed, this is as close as to heaven as you will ever come. If your heart has been pierced by that statement and you would like to speak more about these things, I would be so delighted to be able to do that with you. I'll be down front here at the end of the service. You come forward. Let us open the Word of God together and see what God might have to say to us. God bless you.